Okay, thank you for coming to session two. This is going to build on session one, so we're not going to repeat any of the previous content, but it's not really necessary, so um, we'll do some fun and different things. Um, we're going to spend a lot of time on lookups and getting data out of various places in Excel, and then a little bit more time on modeling and showing ways of charting things that you might not have seen before. And then lastly, uh, the reason you're here, um, how to evade the carry police using Microsoft Excel. So. Um, as, as before, um, the, the normal two caveats apply, dog and pony, so I'm just going to show you things. If they're of interest, go Google them. There is a website, chandoo.org, C-H-A-N-D-O-O. -O. This guy has wonderful Excel material, and it's very uh, interesting and stimulating. So if you want to learn more, go out and check out that guy's website. Uh, very, very good. Secondly, um, our colleague Dawn Lee has actually wanted to occur to me. She's the one who first mentioned that I should teach a class. So Dawn, this is for you. The math continues. Um, second, uh, I'm not a guru in Excel. I just know a few things. So I'm going to, what little I have, I'm going to share in the next 45 minutes, and then I'll be spent for the year. So moving on, um, we're first going to spend a little time on lookups and finding things. And so we have here a, a table with, with various data in it, and we're going to go through various ways to extract data from it. Not the most exciting and exotic thing, but we spend a lot of our work hours doing exactly this. So I'm going to show you some ways to do some lookups and find things that are hidden in our data. Um, the first thing, and again, I realize most folks are probably familiar with this, the match function. What match does, it says go look in a row or a column, go look for something, and tell me what position you find it in. By in and of itself, it's not all that interesting, but we're going to combine it with other functions in a moment, and it becomes very, very powerful because it allows us to not have to hard code things, as we'll see. So that's the match function. VLOOKUP is probably near and dear to the heart of everybody who uses Excel. It essentially goes and says, go look at the table. In this column, find the value. Once you find the value, 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 offset by a couple of, couple of columns and return that, that thing to me. So in this case, we're saying, Hey, in the in the in uh, go find the uh, sales for for May. So we go in in the column. We look up the month of May. We click over a couple of columns and retrieve the result. Again, fairly straightforward. We have a vertical lookup. We also have H lookup, which is the same as V lookup, except it goes horizontally. So we can look across a row, find a value, and then look some number of of rows down from that. Okay. So those are those are those are pretty straightforward. Um, index, though, if you're, if you're comfortable with VLOOKUP, you already are aware there's some limitations to it. In particular, with VLOOKUP, when, when you have an index column you're looking into, I should be sorry, when you have a, a key column that you're looking up into, VLOOKUP can't retrieve values that are to the left of that. It can only go over a certain number of columns to the right. Index, though, lets you get around that. What index fundamentally does is, is it says, look in an x, y, bo x, y, y table, Go down some number of columns, go over, sorry, go down some number of rows, go over some number of columns, right? It's like playing battleship when you were a kid. In this, in this chunk of data, return the X by Y. So in this simple example, we're only looking in a column, and it says, you know, look in this, I hope you can see the, the I tried to blow up the, uh, the formula bar for you this time. It says, look in column D from 14 to 25, return the, the fifth item in. So in this case, we only have a row. We only have an X. In the next one, we have both an X and a Y. We're saying, gosh, starting with B14, go down five rows, go over four columns. Battleship. Um, again, pretty useful. And what's fun about it is we're going to see in a moment, you can start to do some more exotic things by combining with other functions. In particular, match. So here's where it starts to get starts to get fun. So say say we knew we had a, a, a column of sales as we do in column D, and we wanted to find we know that this, there's there's a, a value of 589, and we want to know what month that's associated with. Well, with VLOOKUP we couldn't do that because with VLOOKUP we can't go to the left of the of the, the column we're looking up into. But with index we can use our match function to first find 589. In, in that column, which, which is here. And then, using index, we say, okay, well, we found it. We know that it's five, five rows down. We can use index and say, we're gonna substitute, instead of the number five, we're gonna use this match, this match value to go down that many, that many rows and find it. So it makes, it makes writing formulas a lot easier because you can stop hard coding things quite as much. 
In addition, um, I think we, could, we may have covered the large function. If not, we'll talk about it in a second. You can start to do things like find the largest value in this column, use match to figure out how deep it is, how many, how many rows down it is, and then retrieve some value to the left or right on that same exact column. And again, we'll see more examples where this becomes more powerful, that fast ways to find data or data associated with other data in a big table of data. And we do this a lot. So personally, I, I spend a lot of time writing index, index functions, formulas rather. And then um, I don't think we covered this last time. If you haven't used some product, often it'll help you um, not have to code a bunch of rows of results. So say we wanted to figure out the total tax, the total tax being our sales times some nominal tax rate. We could, for every row, just say equals D14 times F14, put the value here, do this for all the rows, and then add it up. <coughs> what some product does is it allows you to multiply two arrays against one another. So it says, in this, in this particular formula, multiply this value times this value, add it to this value times this value. So it's a very fast way to multiply two or more arrays of data against one another. And again, not all that exotic, but it's something we seem to do a lot, especially when you're doing financial statements or fun, fun accounting things. Questions about that? All right, we will move on. Um, and we'll do sorting real briefly because it's, it's not all that fun, but it's a little bit fun. So the first, the first function I want to introduce is what's called a rank function. It says, look at a column or row or assortment of numbers, and let's rank order them from highest to lowest or lowest to highest, and just show me what position each of those is. So this, this, this says, let's look at this column of ages, and I want you to show me which is, show me for each what their rank is in that column. So item number 44 is the third largest in these five in these five things, and so it gets rank of three. Um, interestingly, since these are identical, they're both 55, they're actually both number one, the rank number one, we're going from highest to lowest, which is good in some ways, but can cause problems, um, and I'll show you a solution for that, for that down below. And with rank, you can rank things from biggest to smallest, smallest to biggest. Um, it has its uses. Um, personally, I prefer large and small um, better. So say we have some some um, values we're trying to find. I'm sorry, up above, I put an arbitrary um, for, for each of these five Jackson family members, uh, monkey not included. Um, I put some arbitrary number of tweets and say we want to find what the largest one is and what the smallest one is. And again, you could use a filter or a, a, a pivot table to do this, but I'm trying to teach you things that will allow you to not have to use pivot tables or do manual operations. These are the kind of things you want to know when you've got a, a big lot of data and month after month after month you want to do analysis against it. So the large function, which I'll highlight here, says, you know, go into a, a column of data in this case and B13 is number one. It says find in that in this in this data area the, the number one thing, the largest thing. And then this one would you find the second largest thing and the third largest thing and so forth. And so we can use large to extract one by one the largest things in a, in a block of data. And small works exactly the same way except opposite, right? We can, we can find what's, what the smallest value is. And using functions we learned before then, if I know that the smallest number of tweets is five, I can use index and match to say, okay, what name is associated with that? Who's on the same row as that? And now it starts to become really useful because often you might have 10,000 rows of values you want to see the top five, you want to see, I don't know, the top five dealers associated with that 10,000 rows of stuff. You don't want to have to manually do that to give you a monstrous headache. So um, small and large can be, can be um, very handy when you want to get um, things sorted in a certain order. But there is an issue with small and large because they can't discern when two things are identical. So say, for example, uh, in, this, in this example, LaToya, she's 55 and somebody else is 55. Well, if we use the large function to say, who's, what's the number one largest value and what's the number two largest value, they both equate to 55. And so when we do our lookup against that using the match function, it's always going to return the first one at five. The first time at five is 55, it's to say, okay, that's the person, Latoya. So it gets confused. A thing you can do, and it's, it's useful um, in other applications as well, if you have cases like this where you're going to have identical data, Instead of just using that identical data, don't, don't um, apply large or rank or small against it. 
Add a little tiny random function to it, so use random, which generates a number between 0 and 1. Divide it by something big, so it's not going to contaminate your data. So, so random of something divided by 1,000 is going to range between, I can't even figure out what it's going to range, but it's going to be small. So I add that to the result, and now each of these ages is unique. And now, I can then do a proper lookup against them, and I get different results. In fact, LaToya sorts second rather than first. So if you ever have to do this where you're trying to pluck unique values out of identical data, this is a, a useful technique. Just keep it in mind. Use random divided by some really small value. And even if you have to add these up and do some mathematical function, as long as you're dividing by, I'm sorry, as long as you're dividing random by a really big number, say like a million, it won't contaminate your results at the end. And so here, we're displaying the age. It's not exactly 55, but it looks like it is. So some basic fun lookup kind of things. Here also, again, I have to deal with duplicate things a lot, so it's, it's, it's top of mind for, for me. Say you have some data and you've got results each month and there's multiple months and say the same dealer name shows up or the same person name shows up over and over. So we've got months like January and February, which, which appear repeatedly, and um, there's names associated with them which appear repeatedly, like a product name or a dealer name, something like that, and each month, they accrue some number of felonies. And, and we want to get a unique list together that only lists each person once, but also can add up all their felonies together. And so our, our challenge then is to find a way to only list each person's name one time. And so what we do, and here's the, here's the technique, is we're already familiar with match. And so I want to go in this list of names, and I want to say, how far deep is it the first time I find it? And in my formula, I compare that to the current row number, which is which is this row function. Row function always returns a current row. So the first time I find it, match from row one down is going to be equal to the row number. So I know it's the first time I find it, no matter how many times it shows up. And so this then returns just the row number, which I'll use in just a second. So now Jane shows up only once in this list, in this column. So I've got, a, I've got Jane listed once, Glenn listed once, Mary and Linda. Um, and Sam and John, who apparently have been having a pretty great year. So now I've, I've pulled out a list of unique values by row number, and I can use my small function to go in and say, okay, go find the smallest row and find me the name associated with that smallest row, and it'll only show up a single time. Even though Jane might be listed 15 times, I only return her in this, in this unique list of values once. And again, Really helpful if it's something you've got a lot of data where duplicate dealer names, duplicate product names, duplicate months, things like that. It allows you to winnow it down into a single unique list. The other thing I'll call your attention to, we're using our if error function that these are wrapped in. And why that's useful then is for these values down here where there's no longer a new unique value. I've, I've shown you all the unique values. We suppress the output. So it's good looking output instead. We just show a, we just show a, a, a null value here if the large or small function returns an error, which it would because we're out of the list of unique values. In addition, um, we do error suppression on this one, just saying, gosh, if C29 is equal to a null, show a null here. Don't have to. It just makes our output more pretty. We're not, we're not displaying junk. And we can even do some crazy math thing here. And I show you this to say, this is something where a pivot table won't do it. Pivot tables can do some mathematical things, but in a case like this where we want to add up all of Jane's felonies and compare them to the median number of felonies, a pivot table cannot do that without a great deal of machinations. Ooh, fun. Um, and here's, my, here's my pithy comment on it. And uh, maybe this time, if, if you guys want the file, just shoot me an email and I'll, I'll reply with the file. We'll take the burden of effort off of our, our beloved HR representative. So just contact me afterwards. OK, changing gears a little bit. Have any of you used the indirect function? This thing rocks. Um, so indirect allows you to build a reference. So a cell reference or a sheet name or a sheet name plus a cell, which sounds not so useful, but it's pretty darn handy. So for example, this is using the indirect function. And, and we're using the concatenate function from previous. We're taking the text A and the number 1. We're putting it together. So that's just literally A1. But we're using indirect to say, Shh, translate this text into a cell reference. So it's showing us what's in cell A1, which is 24. A little bit interesting, but again, that, 
that, that's just sort of the basic principle of how it works, right? It, it lets you create a reference which you can then act upon. So we're saying, show me what's in A1. Where it gets a little more fun is you can build more complicated uses of it. So in this, here's the formula. I'm taking the results of cell D6, which is the word index at the moment, and I'm sorry, worksheet, worksheet that's shown in D6, and then the um, cell which is shown in B8. And so we're taking two bits of text, we're putting an exclamation mark between them because that's, that's the format Excel uses. Um, where this is fun, then we can change, instead of the word index, we can change this to any, any worksheet that's in here, and our result is going to change, right? This thing is just taken, instead of D6 containing the word index, it contains 21. So Excel, the concatenate function puts these together, we've got 21, bang, B, B8. We could change this, I don't know, A1. And it'll automatically go reference that thing in a cell, in a sheet that we just typed in. Again, this is still sort of a parlor trick. Where it becomes actually useful here in the workplace is, say you want to retrieve a bunch of data off of a bunch of sheets, and maybe each month the, the name of the sheets are different, or you've got like 30 bajillion of them, and you don't want to have to type 30 bajillion for them. So say, say, say we were trying to retrieve data like this. So uh, they're not displayed, but I've got a bunch of sheets, 1 through 12 YTD, so monthly, monthly financials. And in each of those, in cell P1, there's a value for unit sales. Um, and so if I were to construct a table and I wanted to pull that value, um, I'd have to manually drag this column down 12, 12 rows deep, and each time I'd have first one is 1 YTD, because that's a sheet name. Second time, 2 YTD. Third time, 3 YTD, right? So it'd be 12, and I have to do that for each of the columns, right? Because right now, I'm referencing P1, over here I'm referencing Q1, here V. Think about if I have 12 sheets and a bunch of formulas, that's a whole ton of typing. Even if you can drag the formula down, it, it's not smart enough to automatically update sheet names. The only thing you can do dynamically, you could say, you know, if it was A1 to begin with, and you drag it down to be A2, A3, A4. But here we don't want that. We're referencing sheet names, and Excel doesn't have a facility to do that that's, that's easy to use. So instead, we can use indirect. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use Excel to build those references, and that way we don't have to type them. So here's an example of that. Oops, excuse me. And we can look, look up top. So now what we're doing is we're, we're, we're creating a, a reference to a sheet 1YTD, which is currently listed in B19. That's the text. We're putting a bang in the middle of it, because that's how Excel knows that what preceded it was a sheet name, and then the contents of cell P1. And now I've got a formula. I can just drag this down, and it's the same exact formula the whole way down. So I don't have to type, I don't have to edit it 12 times to get each of those monthly sheet names. And again, if it's 12 times, it wouldn't make you crazy, but if you've got a whole bunch of columns or a ton of sheets, it would make you insane. And we can do the same thing for, for uh, column D here. We just have a slightly different um, hard-coded hard -coded column. So that's sort of the, 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 a, a basic good use of indirect. But this is still sort of mechanical, right? I still have a hard-coded reference to P and a hard-coded reference to Q. But as you recall earlier, we can use MASH to figure out what column, for example, SVA is located in on um, 1YTD, 2YTD, 3YTD. And so this, again, it gets a little more exotic. But we're just going out and saying, hey, look on each of these sheets individually. Use MASH to find out what column the word SVA is. And that feeds into our index function. What's really cool about this is on each of the sheets, on one sheet, SVA might be in column P. On the next sheet, it might be in column Z. You don't have to have them in the same order. So even if you could write an index function that says, you know, go over four columns each month, if your data aren't consistent, it won't work. So this lets you search for the, the values that you then feed into the index function. And it can vary over every single reference you're looking into. So it becomes very powerful and very dynamic. And again, what it allows us to do then is we've got one formula that we can use 3,000 rows deep and you know 20 rows over, and we never have to retype it. A little bit complicated to set up to, to start with. Um, and again, instructions are in here. Typically when I do these, I usually actually I start by saying equals, and I go and I click on it, and I just slowly build up the, uh, the concatenation value that I'm going to assemble together in text put it in an indirect and make sure that it works. So it takes a little practice to get comfortable with,
but it'll save you just a ton of typing. Things that were just not possible to do because they were too much work, um, you, can sum, you can now do. Because you only have to type the formula one time, drag it over, drop it down, and you've got a single formula that works great over and over and over. Questions? Comments? Complaints? Limericks? Okay. Another thing um, I want to show you, and it, it, it's a little bit exotic, but you might find you have a use for it, are something called uh, user-defined functions. And these exist in lots of contexts and, and languages. Um, but in Excel, we can use VBA and create what's called user-defined functions. Virtually all the other time, I've been talking about Microsoft-defined functions, right? They wrote them for us. But you can actually create your own. I could, I could create you know, the, 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 the Bob function and have it do something based on whatever, well, not Bob, that wouldn't do anything. Um, uh, Wayne, I could write the Wayne function, and it would work hard doing something given some inputs. So this is something um, that I had to do, uh, and it's, it's worked really well for me. Say you have a column of 200,000 dates or 300,000 dates, as I often do, because I pulled some extract out of SAP, and I want to translate those things into your fiscal months, fiscal years, fiscal months names. One approach would be to manually sort them all in order, type in the month name, drag it down, change the next one when the month changes. It would make you insane and your, and your hair would fall out, and, and I don't like that. So I wrote some user-defined functions, and I, I, I emphasize I'm not a VBA guy. It's not my huge area of expertise, but this is the dear fiscal month number function. Have any of you seen this before? Yeah, it, okay, one of you. One of you has. So you can write functions to do anything Excel can do, or even beyond that, using VBA against, uh, against whatever inputs you want. So I'm confident there are engineering functions that Microsoft doesn't provide. There are dear specific things, like no one on earth probably uses our fiscal periods and our fiscal cutoffs. So what this lets me do is I can take 600,000 rows of data and with almost no work, convert them to dear fiscal periods. This is the example. You guys are going to want to do different things in accounting or HR. Um, but if you have repetitive things you need to do over and over and over, this is a really cool technique if, if you know VBA. I'm just clumsy enough to get that to work. The problem with user-defined functions is they're peculiar to your instance of Excel. So if I, if I email you this file, and I will, what you're going to see is pound NA because you don't have the function loaded. So you can either get the function by virtue of getting a template, if memory serves. Um, what I typically do when I'm going to share the results of these is I just copy these to the clipboard and paste them in as values. And then I can share them with, with anybody. Because all I have to do is evaluate it once. The month is going to stay eight for this, for this particular date. So if you do create functions, you need to share the results, copy the results to the clipboard, paste it as values, and now you've got something that you can share with, with your work colleagues. So hopefully this, this provokes some, some thoughts of, of fun things one might do with, uh, with user-defined functions. How do you share the VBA? There, as far as I know, you have to send a, I have to send this template to you and you load it in as an add-in. On the sheet here, um, down below, I show you some of these, where, where the options are to load in these things. So it's, this is, I wrote this to your thing, I gave it a, gave it a title and it's, it's a, uh, a dear file format, a macro-enabled, macro-enabled workbook, I think. But yeah, great question. Okay, and one last kind of fun thing. VLOOKUPs are cool. Um, one of the problems with them is when you do a VLOOKUP, it only returns one value at a time. And so that's often, often swell. But sometimes you might have a bunch of data. So say, you know, you've got data January through February, I'm sorry, January through June. And if you use VLOOKUP to return sales, say you want to get the sales for all the months, you could, you could write seven VLOOKUPs, sorry, six, six VLOOKUPs and just add them together, right? VLOOKUP sales, this, this range, comma one, then plus VLOOKUP sales, comma two, yada, yada, yada. Or you can use what's called an array function. What it allows you to do is essentially combine multiple functions, that same function together over and over and over. So here's kind of what the, the formula looks like. And it's fairly familiar, other than you'll see we got some um, curly cube braces in front of our VLOOKUP and we're summing it. So it essentially says, we <coughs> look up, but rather than just returning what's over in offset two, I want you to return offset two, offset three, offset four, offset five, offset six, offset seven. Um, we're looking up whatever's in B7, which at the moment is sales. Return all those values and sum them together. We could use average, we could use mode, any, any sort of mathematical thing we wanted to do against it. 
And so now we've got a single formula that goes, gets all these, these VLOOKUP results and does some operation against them, which in this case is sum. We could change it to average. And we do, the, the thing when you're writing an array formula, they have to use control shift enter, which is mentioned in red. And we hit enter, and boom, we change the results. So now we're getting av the average of six independent VLOOKUP functions. Again, because we have an input cell here, we could change this to, I don't know, oops, discounts, which is, which is pretty groovy, right? Um, look up multiple things at a time. It doesn't have to be VLOOKUPs. It could be any function that returns multiple results. This is just a, a, common, a common handy one that, that I tend to find I have to use a lot. So now you know the basics of array formulas. Yes, sir? Instead of uh, typing two, three, uh, I, I don't remember the numbers. Yep. Okay. Uh, two, like two colon seven? Yeah. I don't think so, um, but let's find out. Two colon seven. As I recall, it doesn't work, but I could be wrong. Right. But great, great thing, yeah. Because otherwise, it is it is kind of a, a bit of a pain to type two, three, four, five, six, seven. But less less of a pain than typing six feet like a formulas. Great question. Okay. So I've never used the array formulas, but what you're saying is if you if you're going to do an array formula with the brackets, yep. you have to do control shift enter. Yeah, shift control enter to get it to load. Yeah, to get oh. it, and then instead of because if you don't, let me just go over here and I'll just you know I'll, I'll try it, but it's gonna it's gonna blow up. If I just hit enter, we're gonna get a uh, whoops. Lost lost focus. So now it's just gonna pull. It's just gonna pull one of those. Although we're still getting some, some braces. But again, control shift enter will give you array formula results rather than just plain old, plain old enter. And you can discern it because it'll have the little curly braces outside of the formula. So when you see one of those, that tells you, oh, it's an array formula. So it's getting multiple results and doing, and doing one thing against it. Cool. Um, so this is risky, but I'm going to try it. Uh, Excel can actually retrieve external data, and even data from the web. And the newer versions of Excel, which, which we don't have, um, I think you do more stuff. Uh, there's a relatively limited number of sites that will display data in frames and allow you to get it. But we're going to try this live because we like to live dangerously, right, Sam? Mm -hmm. We do. So let me refresh this. Um, and if it works, it'll take a second or it'll blow up quickly. So you can go out to some websites and highlight a table and pull back data. And so this one, I did it for another, for another uh, demo project just for fun. I said, where's the cheapest gas prices in Amex? And holy cow, it worked. Um, and so look at this. This is 1233, so it's live data. We're using our dynamic, our dynamic, uh, uh, dynamic labels we saw in session one, and we're turning real, real live results and showing it in a chart. <laughs> That's pretty cool, right? And again, we probably don't care about gas prices all that much. We care greatly about the location of the police, so we'll show that in a minute. Um, but there are probably other things you can grab. Um, I used to use this to grab stock prices because if you had a list of stocks you owned and a list of index funds and you had some source that would give you results, you could put it in Excel and then at the end of the day you want to know, am I closer to retirement or farther? You can click refresh, boop, 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 it'll drop and grab all your tickers and show you the results of your portfolio and you come to work the next day. So an example, <laughs> an example of retrieving web data, there's lots of places Excel can get data from. I'm not expert, but it's not just web stuff. Relatively limited and relatively brittle, so that's my that's my caveat with web data. But it can be fun, and there's probably internal applications that could take advantage of this that, uh, that I'm not aware of. I mean, maybe you could pull it off of JDSM. What kind of format uh, does that data have to be in? Like, is there a particular website? No, I think it has to be in a frame on the on websites, or in a table. I've seen that, that word used interchangeably, and it's not my area of expertise. I think the newer version of Excel is a little less rigid and where I can grab data from. The example is in here, it's, there's hidden worksheets, so when I send it to you and you go, you go take a look at the source data for the chart, you'll see where it comes from. This is from gasbuddy.com, our good friend. And again, just, just an example to try, to try to provoke thought. So if you find you're frequently pulling data off of some website and you have to type it in, it's worth taking a look to see if Excel can go get it for you with, uh, with just the click of a button. Um, real quickly, uh, I'm fundamentally lazy, and so when I have to assemble long formulas or long strings of text, something you can do is take advantage of, of Excel 
to sort of build those up as if they were text and then change it into a function. So say, say you wanted to write a function that's going to use choose and you want to get from the user a number between 1 and 12 and you automatically translate that to the correct calendar month. Um, and and in, the, in the formula you would write, if you had to hard code it, would be this thing in green, right? Again, not terrifically complicated, but kind of a pain to type, uh, especially if it weren't something intuitively obvious. One of the things you could do is sort of take advantage of Excel's abilities, and I'm just going to do it, do it live, and hopefully it'll work. You can just drag down, and so now we've got all our months, and we've got some formula. And what I'm doing is essentially I'm, I'm using Excel to sort of build up the text that will become the formula. So we're using concatenate just to build up the text, do this. And so our little, our little result gets longer and longer and longer. It's pretty close to an Excel formula, but it's not quite there yet. So we copy that rascal to the clipboard, and we'll paste it in here. And right now, it's not going to show anything. It's going to show that text I built up. And I pasted it in. Whoops. What did I do? Control C. Okay, so this kind of looks like a formula, but it's not all the way there. We've got almost all of our text, but if I put an equal sign in front of it, and I change this last little bit of text to a parent, boom, we've got a formula that works. And so I didn't have to type a bunch of stuff to build up a somewhat long formula. I didn't have to worry about you know typos blowing me up. And I've got a working formula that's pretty easy to put together. So if you ever have to build a long text string or long formula, or um, in Outlook, if you have a bunch of email addresses that you want to be able to paste into the two line, this is a way to sort of build up a long text string. You copy to the clipboard, paste it as a value somewhere, and save yourself a bunch of typing. So again, use my laziness to your advantage. Um, okay, so we're going to go through um, three examples of, of modeling and sharding, each getting a little more sophisticated. And, uh, if someone who uses a great deal of medical expenses, this is of particular interest to me. Um, we're going to start with an example to talk about uh, the, the actual example is whether you should use your HSA to pay expenses immediately or later. That part's not important. But what I want to show you is here we are, we have some inputs with names, and our result then, and it's a single point estimate, is some sort of table that sort of displays you know, a two by two result and then a chart that shows a two by two result, and it's a point estimate, right? So there's no, there's no spectrum of inputs, there's not really a spectrum of outputs, there's just four. And once again, we use, we use our dynamic chart labels to really explain, hey, here's some of my inputs and assumptions, and then the chart itself shows output. So if you print this off or show it to somebody, there's a ton of data here that they can understand, oh, kind of here's, here's some of the assumptions that built this thing up. The last thing I'll show you on this particular simpler example is, is this, where you know, your analysis, your results don't have to be just a chart. There's no reason you can't write formulas that display readable text sentences that somebody can use and interpret and take advantage of. So what looks like um, just plain text sentences is mostly formula driven. And you can use things like greater than and less than and really be able to explain the results to somebody who's reading your, your analysis without them having to necessarily correctly interpret the chart. So a pretty uh, uh, a useful way to explain things. But this is our simple example, just, just um, a point estimate, a little bit funner. And again, this is real world for those of us who, who work here, is which, which healthcare plan should I use? Um, I'm on the family, I got a family, and I'm cheap, I want to spend as little money as possible, but I don't know what my actual medical expenses are going to be. Right? In the previous example, it was a point estimate. We just put in a couple of values. We got a couple of results. Here, we're trying to figure out what healthcare plan we should choose, but we don't know in advance which is going to be best because we don't know in advance, sorry, let me scroll down a little bit, what our actual medical expenses occur, what, that we incur will be. So a way to get a handle on it is to show the range of potential expenses we might incur against the range of net out of pocket and then start to look at something. What this shows us, which is pretty cool, is the spectrum of outcomes and then the magnitude of each of them. And so here's the, 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 the again, the, the details aren't that important other than to say, here's your, your out of pocket under each of the healthcare plans. These are the green and blue line, care plus and care plus max. We can see a couple of inflection points. We can see that you know, the more you incur expenses, the more expensive it becomes. 
we see that they overlap. We also see here, this maps out the difference. The magnitude of that difference isn't all that big. This is a really powerful observation. If you just did a point estimate and you said, oh, I'm probably going to expend 5,000 bucks, then you'd only see these two results. You think, gosh, you know, care plus max, that's the one for me. Or sorry, care plus is better for me. But in reality, you often don't know what, what your input's going to be, what your, say, in this example, your true actual medical expenses will be. So now it can say, gosh, over this entire range of possible expenses, Here's the outcomes. Higher is worse, right? I never want to spend more money out of my pocket because I'm both lazy and stingy. Um, so so this, this lets me see all of those. And it lets me know the difference between them, even at worst, the magnitude is not that severe. You're, not, you're, it's, you're almost given an artificial choice between two identical plans to make you feel good about whatever, whatever value you choose. And once again, um, scrolling down. Sorry, Sam. Um, <laughs> We're grateful for our benefits, they're good, and actually we should be bragging about them more, because especially, as we'll see in the very next example, we have things that most companies don't. Um, once again, we use dynamic chart labels, and here um, we actually sort of do a little bit more math. We say, hmm, in 38% of the permutations we look at, Care Plus is, is cheaper out of pocket than Care Plus Max, and on average, it's 381 bucks cheaper, on, on gross average. Um, in the worst case is when you have some total max out of pocket of 81.31. And here's the, the alternative scenario. And here we can even see the difference between the two plans. So a great way to convey a lot of information and maybe tell us something that a point estimate wouldn't tell us at all. And we've got some calculation stuff that, uh, that I'm not going to through, go through, but if you want to learn more about it, if you ask for the file, that's where, where all the data comes from. Okay, now let's do a real fun example. And again, a benefit the deer offers that few do, so I don't know why you're not on the front lawn with a bugle, um, pensions. Um, often you've, you've decided, do I love my spouse or not? Um, and, and how can Excel help me with that? Uh, so this is, if you're thinking about the pension plan, and should you get the with survivor benefit or without survivor benefit option, that's a, that's a big question because you don't know necessarily how many years you're going to collect the pension, and you don't know after that how many years your survivor will get the survivor pension. And it's important because if you get the without survivor benefit, you get a bigger amount up front, but your survivor gets zero. So if you don't like your, your, your spouse, maybe a good option. Um, you get the Corvette, they get, they get cat food. But maybe you really, you really <laughs> love your, your survivor, um, and, and you want to um, see what the difference might be. So it's a hard question because if you just model the actual results using pension estimator, do it over a range of values, you're just going to get some lines and it's kind of hard to decide. So the intuition here is if we just subtract one from the other, it lets us see the difference, which is the thing we care about. And what we get, and this is the first time I've shown a, a 3D surface chart, essentially, essentially it lets us say um, this axis Sorry, over here, this is how many years the, the earner collects the primary pension. Um, so one year, two years, up to 14. And then this axis is the number of years the survivor collects the survivor benefit. And what we're trying to compare then is across this range of permutations, because again, like the previous example, I don't know in advance, um, unless I go to Switzerland, I don't know in advance how many years I will survive with getting a pension, nor how many years my survivor will get. So now we can look at the range of both of those, right? We've got, we've got two dimensions of unknowns. And the results here, um, a little bit interesting. Um, this is, the, the plane shows the difference between the two. And imagine, if you will, you're looking at an aquarium filled with water up to here, and the <coughs> results of this plane is a sheet of water that's sort of sticking up out of the water at this end. So for example, if I collect my pension for 14 years, my survivor and I die in a tragic gardening accident, this, is, this, is, this maximizes the benefit if I choose the without survivor benefit plan, right? And the, the, the difference is about $50,000. That's, that's how better we collectively be if I chose that option. But if I make it 14 years and my survivor makes it just four years, um, we see it, it goes right down to zero. So those two plans are identical. Any permutation past that with this set of assumptions is underwater. Essentially, in this context, it means you'd be better off having the survivor benefit or more accurately, you and your spouse would be better off having the survival benefit. 
So a way, this, I like this because it's a way to model a range of unknown inputs on two different dimensions and display the results, the number of permutations that are positive or negative, and the magnitude of those. So, you know, if you, you, can, you can make some, some pretty, you, you can do bad things to your spouse right here. Um, please, please don't. Um, and I, I did another example of this. This is the same exact data, just with a few more permutations. And these are, these are more unrealistic, because um, I go up to the primary employee making 36 years of pension and a survivor going another 46, which is reasonably unrealistic, but it shows, again, the spectrum of outcomes. If we were really sophisticated, we actually, we'd actually add a lifespan probability to this, but we're not, we're not, we're not quite that sophisticated. So, uh, surface charts have, have their place and can be, can be very, very useful. And lastly, we're wrapping up quickly. Um, the reason you're here, um, if you're like me, well, you don't speed all that much, but you like, to, you like to accelerate. And Excel can help you avoid the police, and here's how. And again, I'm showing a specific example to sort of spark general thought. <laughs> Carry, I love them. They show on their Town Carry website um, all the, a lot of things the police do including offering citations. So you can go out and choose it. And if any of you are on this, I apologize. I actually looked and I tried to make sure I didn't recognize any names. Um, so if any of you are listed here, I apologize and we'll change it. But you can go out and pull down data. So here I'm just grabbing it off the website, pasting it in as values, and the, the details aren't so important. Um, but once I've got all those values in the sheet, I can use my Excel text functions, which we covered in, in, in session one, to grab out the thing I care about, only speeding citations and the intersection at which they were given. Because police tend to offer, Steve, Steve's actually the, the originator of this, they tend to hang out in certain areas, like in front of the brewery on, on Maynard Road. And so we can pull out these data, and I don't know if you folks knew this, Excel has this thing called Power Map. I don't use it much, but you can feed in map data to it, and now we see, huh, here is where here is where we are at this exact instant. If we take a left on Evans and start blasting past the school zone, police offer a fair number of speeding citations there. Maybe I should be cautious. So number one, you could do this in, in, in using Excel's power map. More fun and more to the point, with that same set of intersections, Excel's, Excel, um, Google Maps rather, is really powerful. You can upload a CSV or a simple Excel file with map data, and it'll display it. In fact, you can do fun things like change the icon where those speeding citations to a little officer with the sash and say, somebody got a ticket there, they were naughty. In fact, <laughs> you can even set up to show the number of citations and change the color based on that frequency count. How cool is that? Is this live data? Uh, depends on the definition of live. I mean, I, so it is. If you, I can go to Google Maps and see this right now. On my phone is Google Maps with this display. This is live. And so if I want to speed home tonight, I can see the locations of where the police were, which is pretty cool. And I, and, I, and I show this not that we really need to speed, but if you think about other things that have, um, so two, two points to this. One, you can use Excel to chew up and massage data and do something useful with it. And here, Excel is just kind of the middleman, right? The raw data is coming from the web. The output I'm putting back up on Google Maps. But Excel can chew through some stuff for you. If it's a tool you know how to use, use it. More importantly is think about all the things we might want to do with mapping, like failure, you know, RLE warranty claims over 2018. If you were to map the location of all of those, might tell you something useful that you, you'd be able to intuitively say, gosh, something's going crazy in Tennessee. I don't know, they must be racing these, these RLEs. I should check that out. Or if you wanted to do like, I don't know, dealer locations or customer locations or places where people are buying our products versus not buying your products, you could use this pretty quickly. It's not hard to upload it to Google Maps and display it. Pretty freaking awesome. So now you know how to evade the police and uh, that concludes uh, session two. Questions or comments, or if you get a ticket, don't come to me. Um, <laughs> this is September data, by the way. All right, well, thank you all for coming to session two. I appreciate it. I'm delighted that there are lots of Excel fans in the building. Thank you all.